Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for our webinar on Microsoft's AI for Higher Education. I'm going to give everybody just another minute or two to log on and get settled and we will get started in just a minute. Okay, it looks like mostly everyone's here, so let's get started. We have some great content for you today, and I want to dive right in, but before I introduce our speakers, I just want to review a little bit of housekeeping for you. Um, if you look at the right-hand side of your screen, there should be a questions drop-down, so feel free to either hit the hand raise or enter a question at any point. We have saved time at the end for Q&A, so I'd love to be able to kind of get everybody's questions in if we can. If we can't, we'll certainly get the answers for anything that we hit time and end and um, send them out to you after the recording is through. Um, so without wasting any more of your time, I'd like to introduce our two speakers. We have Bart Schorsch, Data and AI Solutions Specialist from Microsoft, and Adam Warbeck, Managing Director for Talon's New York Metro region. So Bart, if you're ready, I'll let you get started. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to everyone today. Uh, I'm pleased to, to kick this off by discussing kind of Microsoft's vision for higher education, connecting challenges to outcomes. Uh, this is not a, a picture of our beautiful Fargo, North Dakota campus where I'm, I'm based. I'm a solution specialist for Microsoft focusing on our small to medium corporate space, uh, including education. Um, and so it's a pleasure to talk to everyone today. I appreciate the time. So as I believe I'm required to do in, in almost any Microsoft presentation, I think it's important to start with our, our mission statement that we are here to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. So that's what we're here to do is we're here to, to make sure you have the tools and the technologies that you need to do what it is that you want to do. And specifically today, we're talking about artificial intelligence and higher education, uh, one of our very cool subjects. So. Let's start with kind of the key challenges that are, that are facing higher education today. Um, there's there's a, a wide variety of them. And these are all coming from a Gartner report, by the way, in January uh, of last year. But at no time in history has there been such a unique and, and pressing set of challenges facing the entire higher education uh, infrastructure and system. Uh, some of the key challenges that we're seeing, uh, and again, this is borne out in my conversations with customers, are around funding models. External and internal stakeholders are under continual pressure to provide more value, while the traditional funding sources of tradition, gifts, research, and government allocations are, are con increasingly constrained. Uh, I work exclusively with public sector entities and have for about the past 10 or 11 years, and I very rarely hear the problem that our customers have too much time and too much money. So funding models is certainly a key challenge that's happening. Government policies and accountabilities, global concerns about data privacy and security with uh, security breaches and cyber attacks that you hear about almost every day, uh, result in even more scrutiny for higher education, as well as a very increasingly savvy population that's more concerned about how their data is being used and how they're being targeted, even if it's for benevolent purposes, even if it's well-meaning, uh, how are institutions using student data and what is the, what's the purpose behind it and how is it being used and correlated. BYOD or bring your own IT, cloud and hybrid IT. Today's researchers have access to a greater variety and volume of data than ever before. But the race to publish and the first to be discovered has been limited by reliance on, on local on-premise com compute facilities. It's almost back to the old days of, of timeshares and, and mainframe computing as we seek higher and higher powered um, technology to do some of the massive data analysis and number crunching necessary for even things like biology, uh, genomics, and uh, mathematics, and, and high particle physics. But uh, promising new fields of, of research can be constrained by striving to fund this with any sort of reasonable ROI calculation, even for educational purposes. And unbundled education, what we're talking about there is new anytime, anywhere educational offerings have created a, a great deal of disruption in the way students look at the way they earn and, and market credentials. Uh, air quote here, older students or people returning for education or advanced degrees aren't necessarily looking for that traditional four-year or graduate school experience. 
They might have specific criteria they're looking for for self-fulfillment, job advancement, or re-education as technology makes older skills and even fields obsolete. They might have a very specific thing or set of skills that they need to learn that's not necessarily supported by a traditional four-year or, or graduate school model. And that segues right into evolving student expectations, where technology has enabled a whole generation to grow up as active participants in the world around them, able to create and influence content uh, rather than just be passive receivers of constant education at an allocated time of day. They're no longer uh, like the potted plants sitting in the, in, the, in the classroom receiving education. They expect and, and learn by a, a more integrated interactive experience uh, in what was once a non-traditional way, but is increasingly mainstream. So if those are the challenges, there are certainly some business trends that go along with that. And so we're talking about reinventing credentials. Again, we started talking about the unbundled education with portable and stackable credentials. Uh, a new approach to uh, enable the affordable earning of marketable credentials across an entire career and, and enable that lifelong learning. When we talk about analytics everywhere, we as analytics growing among higher education is part of the answer to the increasing pressure from regulators, as well as parents to improve performance and outcomes in, in efficiency in an increasingly competitive environment. Personalization in education. The emphasis on personalization is in part, I believe, a response to the suboptimal student outcomes. Uh, every educational institution I've talked to has felt the pressure of student retention, graduation rates, and student and employer satisfaction. It's also becoming a key ingredient in attracting students in parts of the market where enrollment is, is very competitive. And did educators 20 years ago think that you, they could be sued over false placement data? Likely not. So that personalization and outcome-based education is, is definitely a trend. Ranking. Uh, ranking lists are increasing the importance as the education ecosystem is expanding global competition for talent. Um, both student and in faculty is getting fiercer. And revenue diversification. Digital technology has made it possible to provide education anytime and anywhere. So as a result, institutions are looking at this as an opportunity to offer online and hybrid programs and extend the geographic reach. So you're no longer listed to local colleges or there's certainly online only institutions uh, that are attracting students nationwide. So they, attract to hope, uh, they hope to attract new learners from new markets, looking for skills and knowledge, but may have those time and travel or even career restraints. Since, of course, I work for a technology company, uh, let, let's talk about some of those technology trends that we're seeing as well. So this is about the third time I think I've talked about digital credentials, but again, we're talking about those uh, credentials that, that stack and that go with these students uh, and, and educators for lifelong learning. Uh, and it's really talking about the increased need for speed and granularity in credential exchanges and creating those portal credentials. Predictive analytics. A majority of the higher education analytics tools currently in the market claim to use predictive analytics, but really they're looking at a constrained model and relatively few sources of data, uh, not enough data points, with heavy reliance on profile data from the student information system and much less use of behavioral data. Virtual reality and augmented reality. There's renewed interest in an adoption of, of VR and AR in higher education thanks to the availability and greater affordability of tools and a growing number of use cases. Um, they enable those users, digital users, to experience um, uh, mixing real world and virtual data into meaningful learning, research, and administrative experiences. And we see this with our own HoloLens technology. It's used in vocational training, or it might be prohibitive to have someone crawl inside of a working jet engine and, and see how it would be repaired. It, it's a little tough to take that home at night. And case studies uh, using augmented reality to teach anatomy for very similar reasons allow students to uh, see these systems working together in a way that an illustration or photograph simply can't accomplish. So next generation student information systems, uh, many of those installed student information systems today have been highly customized to accommodate proprietary and possibly outdated business practices. So that makes system maintenance difficult and expensive. The old model used to be you would buy something off the shelf, spend a lot of money and a lot of time customizing it to meet your your needs. Uh, and then anytime there was an upgrade, it became prohibitively expensive because you had to reinvent the wheel over and over. So CIOs are under pressure to support those non-traditional students with these new modern systems and sometimes outdated systems, um, while also reducing the institutional burden to sustain and move forward with this uh, student information system. And then finally, AI conversational interfaces. 
higher education is exceptionally well positioned to leverage conversational interface since as a general rule you're exchanging 20 to 25 percent of the student population each year so the new students tend to ask the same questions as previous generations giving you a lot of opportunity to train and create these smarter systems so we've seen what the, the technology trends are we've talked about what the business trends are and so what it means for the students and, and again i won't belabor this point but we live in an amazing time of technological progress there's really no historical precedent for the, the pace of innovation and so the implications for students and the university preparing students are, are huge the, the one that always jumps out at me and i've seen this number vary but 65% of students are in grade school. In grade school today, will perform jobs that have not even been invented yet. Uh, a, a simply stunning number that talks about how we must have our educational institutions evolve and be prepared in ways that we simply haven't before. So, so how do we do it? What what do we do? What tools are available? Well, for Microsoft, one of the things we have is something we call our educational transformation framework. And, and don't worry, I'm not really going to read the entire slide to you here. But the idea here is that it's to help you develop a strategy for digital transformation with a holistic long-term view uh, that's broken down into discrete phases that you can begin as soon as you're ready. So the transformative outcomes that we're talking about are what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, establish that holistic vision and integrating multiple systems and data into that single intelligent platform is really what we're thinking about is paving the way to streamline process and, and creating those transformative outcomes to prepare students for the, the, the jobs and the careers of the future. So what are some of those transformative outcomes? Well, the goal here is to create integration that, that leads to insight, um, the lifelong learning, um, the limitless research and the effective institutions. Um, so those are the, really the outcomes we're looking to drive with that framework. And that journey, of course, is powered by data. Uh, it, it is data behind everything that that uh, allows us to create the educational outcomes we're looking for and make the, the, the holy grail of analytics is those data-driven decisions. So what does that mean? Well, traditionally, there's been kind of four phases uh, of that, that school data journey. Um, it was the data was, was in those silos. Uh, it was really unconnected, disconnected. Um, sometimes not even digital. It might have been digitized, not digital, and again, we're going to hear more about that. Um, it was displayed, but it was historical, hard to use, and hard to use to drive change simply because of the timing. Um, the predictability uh, was was still kind of a gut feeling that wasn't really, uh, uh, again, purely data-driven, and there's certainly been some research and discussion around biases, whether willing or unwitting, that have, have crept into the, the uh, analysis. So what do those truly mean? And so obviously this, the goal is still here to drive outcome. So, so how do we do it? A, a more connected approach is really looking at what tools are available at each stage to create, again, the insight. So at the base stage, we're saying what happened? What reports do we have? What data are we collecting? And the why did it happen? That's where we can get into diagnosis. Uh, interactive dashboards that allow for ad hoc and continuing analysis what will happen and that's again where machine learning can come into play given enough data what is the data saying is likely to happen in the future what are some of the outcomes given the inputs and then prescriptive guidance that can talk about recommendations and even create automations on what should i do what should happen so how does this technology work in education what are some of those transformative outcomes what are what are people asking to do well, again, we can certainly get into that, knowing that we're going to be talking about it today. But the idea here is that we're building smart applications. We're building organizational analytics, uh, getting data on and how teams in an organization are collaborating. Identify those top collaborators. Um, see what, who we're working on and who, who's not collaborating. Customize dashboards. Uh, dashboards and portals that give that personalized contextual experience. Smart workflows that combine the structure of organization with a business approval list. Uh, patterns, graph-connected devices, graph-connected powered bots, intelligent business product automation. What does all this look like? What are some of the options this looks like? So going back to some of those connected experiences that we talked about, uh, this is a, a student uh, who is a savvy digital consumer. The student expects a network, of connect, a network of connected mobile experiences at the universities. They want those campus apps for finding roommates getting transportation, booking meetings, purchasing meals, rating courses, and more. And this is technology that exists today. So how do we do it? What, what technologies are behind it? Well, there's, there's a wide discussion on oh, what that looks like. Uh, traditionally, again, we might have had uh, on the left there just a, a variety of data sources. 
simply existing in silos, not really lending themselves to analytics. But again, looking at how we're doing some of these things, putting them together in different types of storage and analysis, um, relational storage bases and machine learning uh, combined with service level agreements that, that create certainty, it can lead to those increases in student performance. It can lead to, again, creating those transformative, agile, modern outcomes that educational institutions are looking for. So there's a ton of education transformation materials online. Uh, again, we you can contact your Microsoft sales representative to to, uh, to discuss it. And we've come a long way from the old red pen and grade book that was used in the dark ages when, when I was in school. But again, starting with that end goal of creating positive outcomes and not just change for the sake of change is what Microsoft and our strong partner ecosystem are, are here to help you do. And we certainly have plenty of ideas on how to do that. And so one of those ideas is uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my fellow presenter. So Adam, are you there? I am. Thanks. Thanks, Bart. Great, great All intro. All right, sir. There you go. Turning it over to you now. All right. I'm going to show my screen here. And as I get started, um, thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, I'm going to focus more on those connected experiences that, that Bart talked about, um, because personally, I feel that there's a lot of opportunity when, when you take the technology to the end user, you're making that last mile connection. Um, and whether it's students or staff or anybody in between, um, there's really the biggest bang for our buck, I think. And, and, and then in terms of data and tying back to that sort of point that Bart was making about data, making the world go round and data is really what makes AI possible. Um, AI learns from the data that we provided. Otherwise, it, it really doesn't doesn't get any smarter over time. Um, it's those experiences um, that that can generate that data and 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 make those and, and then we can turn that around essentially and make those experiences even richer over time. So, in terms of experiences, um, I wanted to kind of walk through the student journey, um, starting off with how you would generate awareness for your program, how you'd promote it. Um, and how you can apply some of these, you know, connected experience concepts and AI in, 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 into that stage. Then let's say we got their attention and somebody's interested in applying and going through the process of enrolling and registering for classes. Um, and, and, and what does all that look like and where, where are the pain points that we can improve with AI? And then finally, they become a student and they're living the student life and eventually they'll graduate and they'll become alumni. And these are communities that we've created and, and Again, with these connected experiences, we should be able to nurture uh, throughout um, and, and, and take advantage of that. So no doubt, you've perhaps tried to do some of this yourself. Um, schools more and more are, are promoting themselves online, uh, whether it's through Facebook or LinkedIn or other social channels. And um, you know, we all know how creepy Facebook can sometimes be. So as, as I started to prepare for this seminar, um, of course, Facebook, you know, somehow figures out my search history and, 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 and starts throwing me ads for various schools. So these are just a sample of the four that I've gotten over the, over the last week. Um, but the reason I actually incorporated them into, into the session, session here is that a lot of these, um, you know, click the learn more if you're interested and it'll just take you to a web page. And that web page will have, you know, what traditional web pages today have. Um, and that's, you know, content and some of it's clever and creative, um, but it's, 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 uh, most of it is very one way. Um, they're pushing information to me, trying to convince me that this is the program for me and that I should enroll and this is where I should spend my money and my time. But imagine if we could make that a little bit more interactive. Imagine if, if I wasn't just taken to a web page that was pushing content to me, but something that was engaging me and, and, and actually at the end of that experience where I felt like I learned something, or if nothing else, my time was spent valuably. And we have a story here that we're gonna show a demo of in a second um, of a program at Rutgers University. There's a Center of Innovation Education at Rutgers. Uh, the program focuses a lot on certificate-based programs. Um, they've taken this extra step of, of, of accrediting them, so anybody that, that passes one of the certificate programs actually gets college credit towards if they're perhaps learning, earning an MBA somewhere or just need continuing credits. Um, but more importantly, um, the program focuses and it is geared towards people, you know, professionals that are working, um, and, and, and the curriculum is designed to be around issues that are 
of interest to corporations, you know, in today's environment. So, so one of those is customer experience and the whole customer experience from how you get customers to how you service customers and support them in the whole lifetime. Another, another program is centered around design thinking and bringing in those concepts into designing and redesigning your business models. Um, a third one, as an example, is cybersecurity. Um, we were familiar with the customer experience program, and, and one of the things um, that we pitched them on recently was the idea that maybe they could take a piece of their curriculum and use that to promote the program. So on the first day or one of the first days of, of class, the instructor would give the students this assessment to take, and the assessment would grade or be designed to essentially grade um, or have the student grade their organization on how well they're doing in customer experience. So anything from strategic questions to operational questions to finance um, and how projects are structured and, and really give you a feeling for where are you doing well and where do you need to improve? And all that comes out at a, as a score at the end. But this was very offline. And again, it was just for the students. So one of the ideas here was, hey guys, this is something you potentially use to promote your program. Let's make it interactive. Let's make it digital. And then you can put it on your website. You could use it as part of your Facebook or LinkedIn campaigns. Heck, it might be so interesting that people would just share it without you even paying for it uh, pay as an advertisement. And then the beauty of it is whoever's taking this assessment is obviously getting something in return. They're, they're getting a score. They're able to see how well they're doing and which areas they need to improve in. But, but the even more valuable piece to the program is that behind the scenes, all those clicks, all those trig signals are being recorded. And so now Rutgers can potentially reach out to say a big corporation based in New Jersey and say, hey, we had 15 people from your, from your company take our survey. Looks like you guys are doing really well, but there's some interest in customer experience and there's maybe one area where you're not doing so hot. And so obviously the outreach there is, is very warm uh, it's, it's rooted in a, in a lot of good data, data that was provided to the program by the folks um, taking the survey. So just to show you a little bit of a, a demo of how that went, let me try to pull it up here. So this is the actual um, survey. So I can see here that it's asking me questions. Um, it's very approachable. These are you know kind of plain English kind of questions and answers. Um, I could type the answers in. I could I could just simply click the buttons. But either way, as I go through this, it's going to complete, and this has a, a lot of sections, so I'm not going to click through the whole thing here. But as I get to the end, it shows me my progress, and eventually, and once I submit, submit at the end, I'm going to get a score. And when I get that score, uh, it can be emailed to me, I can share it with friends, and that sharing is what creates kind of a viral element um, and, and potentially lets me you know, share it with my colleagues and others with, within the company. All that goes to, to, to kind of support that story of where at the end, you know, both the, the, the people taking the survey as well as the Rutgers program getting all this great data, that, like Bart mentioned, that data being so valuable to potentially make some decisions around whether to attend the class and again, for the program to be able to promote this to, uh, to those students. The next section, so let's say we've gotten their attention and they're ready to apply. So we go through this whole admissions process. And a lot of times this is fraught with not just tension, but a lot of questions. And did I get my application in? Is it completed? Do you have everything you need? And imagine all those questions coming into your, your staff. And, and some of these questions, obviously they're easy to answer, but they still take time to answer. And so think about areas where maybe technology could assist you in that. And simple questions that could be answered online, not only is there a convenience factor, but online is available 24-7. So your staff could be at home sleeping and students or prospective students could still be getting their questions answered. Additionally, if you're freeing up your folks from having to answer the simple questions that, that may be the biggest volume of the calls, they're obviously now free to help students with, with, with deeper issues or, or bigger problems that need to be met. And then let's say you, you, you extend an offer and, and the student accepts, there's still potentially that time frame before they actually start their first class, uh, some of that summer melt that happens where, where people sometimes don't even show up on campus. Um, 
that engagement or that gap is, is ripe for engagement. And digital experiences like these could help make sure the student's comfortable, make sure they have their questions answered, make sure they know where to go once they arrive, uh, where, to, where to check in, where to attend orientation, all those, all those things. And all that could go and support, again, augment your staff and, and just alleviate and make everybody more efficient. So let's say we've gotten to school, we made it to campus, now it's time to register for classes. And it's been a while since I've been in school, but I remember even back then that this wasn't an easy process. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you'd kind of make your schedule based on, or your an idea of a schedule based on the classes you knew that you needed to take, based on maybe working around the fact that you've got a job. Maybe you're a morning person. Maybe you're the farthest from a morning person. Maybe you have a job in the afternoon, part-time perhaps, that you need to work schedule around. And then there was the sort of wild card that even once registration opened up, there was an element of, oh, sorry, this class that you wanted is already full. And then what was my backup plan? And did I have a backup you know, schedule already made up? Well, think about all those questions that I just laid out there and couldn't AI essentially be really good at understanding those simple things and perhaps making a schedule for me. And maybe it can't do all the registration because obviously there's money involved. But if you think about e-commerce and Amazon, able to you know, ship us packages in two and sometimes or soon to be one day uh, with the click of one button, there's probably a lot we could be doing for registration that would help these, these, these students um, you know, essentially not feel the pain that we felt you know, 20 and, and, and more years ago. And if we don't do it, um, and if you have a computer science program at your school, then it's very likely that some um, Computer science genius will try to do it themselves. And this is exactly what happened in a university um, recently where we found this article that we read. Um, and, and the idea was you know, simple. This kid was just going to create a bot that, that was going to register for his classes, um, except you know, then you get into, is, should you be doing that? Is the play, playing field level? And are you hacking in you know, to your university system by creating your bot? And so isn't it just going to be that much more simple and, and straightforward if the school provides these capabilities and students don't have to hack their way into registering for classes? And then we've got them in, they're taking classes, um, and this gets into that, starts to create or set us up for those connected experiences becoming connected communities. And there's all kinds of studies um, around uh, in both the commercial space as well as the education space around apps and engagement and you know how people will feel connected when they're close and, 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 and interacting versus as they become a little bit more detached and a little less interactive, those are usually indicators that they might be thinking about dropping out, they might be having some sort of troubles and you know, picking up on those signals is an opportunity for all of us to become more proactive instead of reactive. So there was um, the one particular study that I'm thinking of was a company that had implemented some uh, tools to essentially help employees reward and praise each other, um, kind of build a community digitally around a workforce that was dispersed geographically. And geographically, obviously, it can be across your campus, it can be across many campuses, and, and it could be even across, across the globe. But what they found is they studied the data that came out of these experiences was that they learned that somebody that was active at a certain point and maintain a certain level of activity, it was very unlikely to become, to essentially quit the company. But there was a certain amount of predictability and, and that's what all you know that AI is, is really just a statistical measure of how probable is the outcome. But once you, know, you get to a certain threshold, you start to see that you know, there's a certain likelihood of one that we shouldn't ignore that this person might be at risk for dropping out simply because they become less and less engaged. And so having these communities um, and, 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 and promoting them and supporting them uh, enables us to, to A, create that level of engagement, but also B, have the data, again, those signals created that we can study and potentially uh, improve you know, our ability to respond and, and essentially increase our graduation rates. 
So there's just a handful of quick ideas about how this could work. Um, there's obviously not enough time here in a seminar like this, you know, to, to cover to cover all of them. And, and really a big part of it is just like with the Rutgers example is making it unique to, to your organization. Uh, there's gotta be something that you're already doing that potentially could be leveraged or something within your culture or, or your environment that's going to be um, some, you know, something that would would make your program stand out, and 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 putting putting that out into these experiences is gonna is gonna just like we saw those ads, and they pretty much all looked the same. They were all, you know, while they were all different programs, one healthcare, one one business related, and another was technology related. There wasn't much to set them apart. If you squint your eyes and take a step back, you know, they were all pretty much very similar. Whereas, you know, how can we make these things more more exciting and more engaging. And so that's what we wanted to, to, to kind of end with here is, is really how to get started. Um, so as, as, as Bart said at the conclusion of his presentation, you know, you've got to have a strategy. Um, take a step back and, and think about what that is. Um, obviously, the framework he laid out had a number of pillars in it, and, and there's probably folks that are, you know, addressing each one of those pillars um, through their sort of respective specialties. In, in this experience pillar, um, there's a number of skill sets that are important. Um, some of them you can kind of think of uh, are, are common to the startup world where you have this idea of a, of a product owner. And so somebody in that seat is essentially representing those stakeholders. And in your case, it's going to be, you know, the, the, the school as well as the end user's interest, right? So the student, if it's geared for the students, the staff, if there's a staff component. And then that product owner needs to work with some good designers, people that understand not just how to make things look pretty, but really understand kind of the psychology with how people interact with technology. And you want to make sure that you consider everybody on the spectrum, again, from students to staff, but also everybody in between. And then finally, once you have those two, you have the strategy, your goals, you know who you're building for and what it's going to look like, how it's going to feel, then finally you can select the technology. And you want to select technology that's future-proof. So like Bart mentioned before, we were, you know, spending a lot of money, doing a lot of bespoke um, integrations, and, and, and then as, as, you know, technology evolved and, and the old stuff became stale and, and there was, you know, shiny new things to chase, it was very expensive to keep up. Um, what's nice about the technology that's available to us today is everything is very small. Um, you need this piece of capability. Even these AI services that we're kind of touching on here in the seminar are very, very specialized. There's one that help, you know, it's a mach machine capability that, that can, can read documents or images and recognize what's in them. Another one can, can hear speech and translate it into text. The reverse of that is something that can take text and translate it into speech and so forth and so on. Each of these are distinct little nuggets of computing capability. And because they're small, they can be put together like little Legos in many different ways. And that's really the, the, the art and science of step three. But, but because everything is kind of in one of these little atomic units, they can be easily swapped out in the future when technology evolves. So getting in, into how to approach this a little bit, just to leave you with some advice. Um, Again, in the field of these experiences, we're really living in that world of digital and a strategy here, there's really two that, that happen most commonly. You're either creating something brand new, some new program, um, some new school that hasn't existed yet. And perhaps, you know, it's, 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 it's something that nobody's seen before or you're transforming an existing program and simply making it better. And 80%, if not more, of the world is transforming, both in the business and the education space. It's really about bringing what we have into the digital age. Um, the innovation side is something, you know, the quintessential story there is something like an Apple iTunes, right? Um, when iTunes came out in the early 2000s, well, there were still record stores that you could go to in malls. And most people were, you know, used to or begrudgingly buying whole albums. You might like one song uh, from an artist, it, you'd have to buy the whole album. Also at that time, a lot of people, especially the younger crowd, were not paying for music at all. There's plenty of services uh, available during the top dot com, early dot com days that simply allowed you to pirate music. And yet Apple comes out with this service, backed obviously by some hardware in the iPod, and says, you know what? You don't need to buy whole albums. 
If you only like one song, just buy one song. They're all going to be 99 cents. And fast forward a few years, and it became you know the world's largest music retailer. Obviously, the record stores we used to know don't don't exist any longer. And so that's that's an example of a true innovation, right? Something that didn't exist before, and and, and the market that was created, and the business line that was created. So again, we're mostly on the uh, on the transformation side, and in what we're talking about here. And then we've mentioned it a number of times now, but really, you know, stick to that experience-driven transformation. Understand, you know, who it is it that 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 we're trying to target that we want to use these. And I've got a couple slides coming up to dive into that deeper. And then, you know, for the staff and everybody in between, if you've got a great customer experience, you're going to get a lot of business. If you get a lot of business, you've got to have the staff that can handle it. And there's really a couple of things you know, when it comes to the employee experience. Number one is the fact that it's efficient so that obviously you can handle all that business or the wheels will come off the bus. Number two is that employees that work in cutting edge organizations expect to use cutting edge tools to do their jobs. And that brings us to number three, the employees themselves. You've got to be able to retain, recruit and retain employees just as you re recruit and retain students. And all that seems to, seems to go really well hand in hand in this new digital age. So thinking about that student journey, let's take the one we just went through, you know, from the college search process through application and enrollment, finally registering and, and enjoying that student life to finally hopefully graduating and becoming an alumni. And if we think about, you know, from the student perspective, but really anybody else that might be using the system, these are these personas. You got to think about who is it? What do they think and feel? And pick one of those in the, in, the, in the journey. Don't try to knock them all off at once. And if you do want to do multiple ones, do this process for, for, for each leg separately. Um, so let's say, for example, for the awareness piece, you know, somebody in that awareness stage, who is it? And what are they thinking and feeling? What do they want to see? Like we talked about, if I'm scrolling through my feed, do I want to see an ad? Or am I going to respond more to something like, um, for example, you know, with the, with the Rutgers survey, there was a stat that said basically that 80% of companies think their customer experience is great, yet when you ask their customers, 90% of their customers think it's horrible. So, you know, something like that catches your eye and, you know, there's all kinds of clickbait on the internet, right? But, but something like that is more interesting than simply just seeing a traditional ad. And then, you know, what, what does it say? What does it do? What do I hear and as I'm interacting with this? And essentially, you're going to end up with some of these pains and gains that will help you assess, you know, and, and eventually these will help you prioritize where to focus your efforts and your time and your dollars. And then as once we once we figure out who, is it, who it is we're targeting, all the different personas that are part of a certain process, then we've got to think through some, some other things. You know, how do we get their attention initially? We just talked about examples of that. Gain their interest, right? So take me through this survey. I'm going to get something, something out of it. That leads to that desire um, because I want to see the score that I get and, and, and see, you know, if, if it's where I thought it would be. And ultimately, there could be an action at the end of that, right? If I see, okay, we're doing well here in these two areas, but we're really, really bad in these three areas, that's going to lead me to maybe have more contact with that school and that program. Ultimately, then that could lead me to the next step of how do I get onboarded? How do I enroll? Where, where do I pay my tuition? When is the class? And then obviously, some of those student life and connected community components um, can keep me engaged as the class date is approaching, as, as well as, you know, after the class, obviously, everybody that goes through it is going to be part of this community of people that want to make, in their case, their customer experience better. So wh why, why not support that and, and, and provide that um, and keep them, in, keep them engaged? So just to, just to recap overall, it's the strategy first, the experience second, and then the technology. And we're living in a great time to be building new technology because it really is um, just so much more cost effective. The, the things we can, we can put together in days and weeks now used, used to be either impossible or take you know, years and, and millions of dollars. So it's very, very exciting. So if you have any questions um, about anything that we discussed, I know, you know, went through a lot really, really quickly. Um, but we do have a template that kind of summarizes everything we showed and especially that process that, that we just walked you through. And it would help you if you if you start to try to go through this yourself. 
uh, it would guide you through some of your thinking and, and help you fill in fill in those gaps. So if you're interested in that in that template, uh, definitely reach out to us, and we'll be doing some follow-ups. And thank you to um, our partners at Microsoft. Um, definitely appreciate Bart kicking us off and getting us out of the gate um, with a great keynote on on some of the higher level opportunities in education and data. Thanks, Adam. Um, we actually did have a couple of questions come in, so I'm not going to take up too much of your guys' time, but I do want to get them answered if we can. Um, the first one is actually for you, and it refers back to kind of the Rutgers bot that you guys built. It looks like this person wants to know how long it took um, from development through implementation for you guys to get that off the ground for them. If, if you're asking development technically, it's it's actually very simple. Um, I would say it's a matter of weeks. Um, from the technical side, the long the longest part is 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 actually just planning out. You know, what is it going to say? Uh, is there a voice, certain voice you want your bot to have? Um, do do you want it to be kind of playful and 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 colloquial, or do you want it to be really serious or something in between? Um, luckily for them, since it was a survey or assessment that they already were doing in in the class, those questions, you know, they were already there, so we could just simply plug them in. So that all up, you know, only took only took a number of weeks. Uh, if you had to start from scratch and create some content, you know, it, it's gonna it's gonna take a little bit longer. But again, the point being is that you know like I was saying earlier we're living in a great time and that the technical piece is actually is actually the easy part thank you um, the next two it looks like are for Bart so the first one says would I need to modernize or use all Microsoft data sources if I want to use your technology <laughs> well, uh, my, my sales manager would like that, but no, actually, you don't have to. Uh, Microsoft loves open source. Uh, I believe uh, between a third and half of everything running in our Azure product today, for example, is, is on a Linux workload. So, no, Microsoft loves open source, and we can work with a huge variety of data sources and, and what people are, are owning and using today. Awesome. Okay, the last one um, says, do I need to go, quote, all in with these technologies to start? Great question. So, no, you don't actually have to uh, have your entire plan um, fleshed out to, to get started. We certainly recommend it, uh, that you have you know, some ideas and some milestones. And again, we have great partners and we have uh, your account executives uh, that can help you uh, guide you in, in the journey. But no, you don't have to have a, a million dollars to spend right away. This can absolutely grow and you can see that ROI and, and we're here to support you in the long term. So no, you don't have to have everything um, done initially, but it certainly helps. But uh, we're here to help. Okay, and we just got one last one. I don't know, it looks like both of you might be able to answer this. It just says, what size schools would this be suggested for? So I don't know if it's AI capabilities completely or if it's something like the bot, Adam, that you were referring to. Yeah, I would, I would say it, 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 all, it all works for all sizes. It, 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 you, you may not need all of it if you're a smaller school and, and, and you're going to you know, need a whole lot of it if you're obviously a bigger school um, you know, with, with bigger problems. But like with the Rutgers example, you know, we're focusing on a, a, a pretty modest um, certificate-based program that maybe has a class a quarter of, I don't know, I'm guessing a couple dozen to three dozen people, right? So so that's that's pretty small. Um, and there was still value, you know, in helping them promote it and, and, and get enrollment and create those communities. Um, whereas, you know, you scale up from there, you're getting into hundreds and thousands, uh, hundreds and th thousands of students. I would agree with that. I think it, it's very scalable. Uh, in, a lot of our cl cloud technologies are intensely scalable, meaning that a, as your consumption uh, need rises, we can rise to meet you. So uh, you can start very small, uh, pretty inexpensively, and, and start adding and building on these technologies. Simple bots um, I've seen built in, in as little as a day. Uh, by people with very little technical background. Uh, a lot of step-by-step -step stuff, but again, it's it's pretty simple to implement and scales with you and can work with customers of all sizes. Thank you. Um, that looks like all the questions we have so far. Um, so like Adam said, we'll be sending you all a follow-up with a recording to the webinar. We will send you the contact information for both Bart and Adam so that you can have their information if you have any further questions. 
Um, please share this with your colleagues if they weren't able to attend today and you think they'd be interested. And please do feel free to reply to our follow-up if you have any further topics you're interested in learning about at a later date. So we will gift you 14 minutes of your day back, and I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks.